Here we'll take a look at confidence intervals and what it means to set up a confidence interval and what it is that we're confident about. The idea goes back to the stuff we were doing in the last chapter about sample means. So we calculate different samples, take different samples, and we calculate the average of each sample. Well, by doing that, we're not capturing the entire mean for the population. We're only capturing the mean for a certain sample of that population. Depending which items we choose to be in that sample, we may end up with very high means or very low means, or we might be dead on accurate and end up with the mean for the population or one that's very close to it. So the analogy is you go down to the car dealer, you're looking at the average price of the car that's at that car dealer. Well, if you pick 25 cars at random, you may end up with only the most expensive cars or only the least expensive cars, or you might end up with a good representation of all the cars that are sold at that dealer, and you'll be able to calculate then a good estimate for the mean. So there's a couple of terms that we should become familiar with. Right? One of them is the confidence interval. The confidence interval has two numbers, right? the bottom and the top. It tells me that I'm somewhat confident that the actual average for whatever it is that I'm calculating is between these two numbers. So you'll have a low end and a high end. The confidence level is how confident I am that the mean is actually between those two numbers. Am I 90% confident? Am I 95% confident? So another way to think of this is you give the temperature for the day, right? I say the high temperature for today is going to be 65 degrees. Well, I'm going to have not so high of a confidence that the temperature is actually going to be exactly 65 degrees. But if I give myself a little wiggle room, maybe I say, eh, it's going to be between 63 and 67. All right, I'm more confident that the high temperature is actually going to fall between those two values. Now, you can go to the silly level and say, well, I think the temperature is going to be between 30 and 100. All right, I'm 100% confident that's going to happen, but that's not very useful of a measure. So there is a balance between the actual interval and how confident you are that the value falls between those two endpoints. The confidence interval estimate just says I'm going to combine those two pieces of information together. I'm going to take the confidence interval, and I'm also going to tell you how confident I am that the numbers fall between those two values. So my note is that it's possible that your interval doesn't actually contain the mean. So if I picked only those low price cars or I picked only those high price cars, it is possible that the confidence interval does not contain the mean. That's why I'm not 100% confident. I might be 95.44% confident. I might be 95% confident, 97% confident, but not 100% confident unless you have a really big confidence interval. So I pull up this example here to go over some of the introductory versions of it, and then we'll look at a little bit more in confidence intervals in a minute. Here's an example. Stole this out of the textbook. 45 home improvement jobs are sampled from across the country. My question is, how can I come up with an interval that contains the average home improvement price across the country? So the sum of the costs for the sample of 45 jobs is as given, right? $129,849. So the first thing is I'm going to use those 45 jobs to give me a point estimate. A point estimate contains only one value. And so the point estimate for this should be easy to calculate. I'm going to write up at the top. Hopefully we can see this. The point estimate is going to be the cost of all the home improvement jobs, $129,849. And then I'm going to divide it by the 45 jobs. And that's going to be my mean for that specific sample. I know you can't see me doing this, but I'm typing this into my calculator. 129,849 divided by 45. I come up with $2,885 and 53 cents, it would make sense to round this, so to speak, to the nearest cent. So that's my mean for those 45 jobs. The second part says I'm supposed to assume a population standard deviation of $1,350, obtain a 95.44% confidence interval for the population mean budget. Now, here we're going to rely on some information that we learned a couple of chapters ago, I think. If you have a standard normal curve, it looks somewhat like this, and you have one standard deviation above and below the mean, two standard deviations above and below the mean. 95.44% of the data falls within two standard deviations of the mean. So we don't have to go rely on z-scores or anything for this. We can just look at it and say two standard deviations from the mean contains 95.44% of the data. 
All right, the other piece of information that's given to us is the standard deviation. Now, that's the standard deviation for the population. We want the standard deviation for the sample. So if I want the standard deviation based on the sample mean, what I should do is take the population standard deviation and divide it by the square root of n, where n is the number of items in the sample. So in this case, there's 45 items in the sample because that's how many jobs were calculated. So 1,350 divided by the square root of 45. And that's the standard deviation that I'm going to use when I do my calculations. So let's take 1350 divided by the square root of 45. And that gives me 201.25 if I round it to the nearest penny. Because remember that these are still dollars, right? Because I'm working with a dollars and cents type deal. So how do I actually calculate the confidence interval? Well, the confidence interval is going to be the mean, which in this case is 2885.53, plus or minus, meaning I could go above or I could go below, and actually I'm going to need to calculate in both directions. What am I going to calculate? Well, I'm going to calculate the number of standard deviations, which in this case is 2, and then the standard deviation itself, 201. 0.25. All right, let's do a little adding and subtracting. 2 times 201.25 is 402.5. So I'm two standard deviations above and below the mean. And now I've got two calculations to do. When I answer, I'm going to answer inside of an interval. So take 2885. 0.53 and subtract 402.5 and that gives me 2483.03. That's my low end. Now take those same numbers and on some calculators if you just hit the up arrow or second and answer it'll take you back to the previous line then just change the minus to a plus. Pro tip there. 3288.03. All right. This is my confidence interval. I am 95.44% confident that the actual mean price of all of the home improvement jobs across the country are between those two numbers. That kind of a range of numbers, right? A little under 2,500 to a little under 3,300. So it's a decent range of numbers, but I'm 95%, 95.44% confident that the actual mean is somewhere between those two values. Okay, what if I want a percentage that's not 95.44, right? It could be 68, but we really don't usually look for confidence levels that are that small. Usually they're like 90%, 95%, 97%. What do we do if we want values that are not at clean standard deviations like plus one, plus two, and so forth? Here's what we do. We look at this process, okay? One of the things that you're going to be introduced to is this alpha symbol. So the alpha symbol is 1 minus the confidence level. So if I wanted to do it with the problem I had before, if the confidence level is 95.44%, so as a decimal point 0.9544, then the alpha is 1 minus 0.9544, and that's how I get that alpha value of 0.0456. So Z alpha, that's the notation that we use, is a z-score that has an area of alpha to the right. So what I'm saying is, if I have this normal distribution, then z-alpha is that z-score over there that has an area of 0.0456 to the right. So obviously, I'm exaggerating a little bit. That's a very small area, but my marker is only so big here. So z-alpha has that area to the right. z-alpha over 2, which is actually what you're going to see more commonly in these calculations, is a z-score that has an area of half of alpha to the right. The idea is that if you're trying to find a certain percentage in the middle, you're going to split what's left evenly between that area on the left and that area on the right. So you would oftentimes take that alpha score and divide it by 2 in order to find what z-alpha over 2 is and use that in your calculations, Okay, splitting whatever area is left between that little piece on the left and the middle little piece on the right. Hi, right, this is the actual formula, the actual process. 
And you'll see it again on your formula card also. In fact, if I can bring this up here, you should be able to see. Here it is, right there in Chapter 8. Okay, so you've got the formula for the Z interval for mu where the standard deviation is known. And here it is, X plus or minus Z alpha over 2 times the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of items in the sample. All right, so the confidence interval goes from below the mean to above the mean. So that same formula here is also listed in your formula sheet. All right, so suppose I have my problem. I was talking about car sales before. So if I go back to my car sales problem, suppose the mean cost is 18,000, population standard deviation of 2,400, and I'm going to add into this problem that my sample size is 25. Okay, so I want to find a 95% confidence interval for the mean. I made a note down here that if you go to the PowerPoint that goes along with this, I have instructions on how to use the TI-83 Plus to help you out to find some of those values. I'm still expecting that you're going to show me the work and the setup and the process, but the TI-83 actually will let you find confidence levels and confidence intervals from the data that you put in. So you'll input the different information, go down the bottom, hit calculate, and it'll pop out an answer. What could be better? All right, so I'm going to slide this over so we could work this problem out over here. What information do I have from the problem? First of all, from my sample, the sample mean was 18,000. That's what I got by wandering around this poor car dealer's lot and picking out 25 cars and finding the average price. Right, so the number of cars on the lot was 25. What other information do I have? The population standard deviation was given to me. Don't ask me how I got it, but I snuck in in the middle of the night and figured out the population standard deviation was 2,400. By the way, oftentimes we won't know that information, and there's a process coming up after this that'll help us to figure out what to do if we don't know the population standard deviation. All right, the next thing we should do is find our alpha. So we wanted to be 95% confident. Well, if we want 95% confidence, then alpha is going to be 0.05. In other words, it's going to be 1 minus 0.95. That's our alpha. The formula that we were given references this z alpha over 2. So z alpha over 2 is going to be z 0.025. In other words, it's a z score where 0 .2, 0 0.025 of the data is to the left. Now, Here's a little trick. If you go back to your formula card, you could scroll all the way down to your charts. And for some reason, I mind the charts are always sideways. Um, you could go down and you could look at that chart to find out the z-score where the area is 0 0.025 or subtract it and find 0.975, right, which will give you the positive z-scores. But there is a little trick. If you come down to the bottom of the next page, underneath this mysterious t-table, there is a little box down the bottom here that has Z.1, Z.05, Z.025. You can use these numbers to help simplify the process a little bit. So Z.025 is 1.960. So I'm going to take that 1.960 and I'm going to steal it from my problem. All right, so come down the bottom of table four and there's these little Z alpha scores. You can use those in the calculation. So Z.025 is 1.960. Okay, what does our formula tell us to do? It says to take the mean, right, the sample mean, plus or minus Z alpha over 2 times the population standard deviation over the square root of n. So take 18,000 plus 1.96 times 2,400 over the square root of 25. When you calculate these things, work from the inside out. So take the 2400, divide it by 5, because that's the square root of 25, multiply that number by 1.96, and that gives me 940.8. So I get 18,000 
plus minus 940.8. Okay, so then the last step is just set up the interval. 18,000 minus that number. So 18,000 minus 940.8 gives me 17. zero five nine point two and then if I add it I'll clearly get eighteen nine forty point eight so I am ninety five percent confident that the mean falls somewhere between those two numbers that for all the cars that were sold at that car dealership that the actual average is somewhere between those two numbers All right, let's try another one or two, and then we'll talk about errors. So here's a problem about the Rolling Stones. Right? At one time, the Rolling Stones band, well, I mean, until the pandemic hit and everything, they were still active and touring, even though they're getting a little old there. I want to know what their gross earnings were for their, for their concerts, like in general, how much does the Rolling Stones make for each of the concerts they perform? So I selected 30 random concerts. The mean gross earnings was 2.27 million. So right away, I've got my sample mean. My sample mean, $2.27 million. Assuming a population standard deviation of half a million, the number of concerts that were in that sample are 30. I want a 99% confidence interval. So a 99% confidence interval means that alpha is 1%. Okay, if alpha is 1%, then what I'm looking for when I do Z alpha over two is Z of 0.005, right? Because if I have 0.01, half of 0.01 is 0.005. So now let's go back to my chart over here. Hey, look, I have a Z.005 is that last entry in here in that little box. So 2.576. So now I got 2.576. What does my formula say to do? It says to start with the 2.27, because that is the sample mean, plus minus that Z alpha over two, so 2.576 times the standard deviation, which is 0 0.5 over the square root of n, so over the square root of 30. All right, so let's take 0.5 and divide it by the square root of 30. Watch your order of operations here so that you don't end up with the wrong answer. Then take that answer and multiply it by 2.576. All right, this gives me 2.27 plus minus I get 0.235, but let's make that 0.24, just because if the first number has two decimals of accuracy, let's keep that for the second one also. All right, so on the left end, if I subtract, I get 2.03. If I add, I get 2.51, okay? Which doesn't look like a huge range, except that these are in millions of dollars. So it's somewhere between 2.03 million and two and a half million. So I have about a half a million dollar wiggle room inside of that confidence interval. All right, let's take a look then at margin of error. Margin of error is essentially how far away from the mean I am on either side. Here, I'll find you the margin of error for this problem, is this thing right here. That 0.24 is the margin of error. So it tells me how far away from the mean I am. So I'm 24 hundredths, uh, 24 hundredths of a million dollars on one side and, and 24 on the other side, right? So I can look at this in two ways. I can look at it as I have the standard deviation and the sample size tell me the error, or I can flip it around and say, I'll tell you how much error I'm willing to accept. You tell me how many items I need in that sample in order to produce an error that's no more than that. Um, the one thing then to be careful of is you're going to round that up to the nearest whole number because you need that extra. So even if your number came out to be like 84.2, you would round it up to 85 because just 84 is not enough to produce an error that's that small. 
you got to go up to the next one, right? It's like the old problem where you have a certain number of children and a certain number will fit on each school bus. How many school buses do you need for the class trip? You have to round up to the next, next school bus. Otherwise, you'll have like five or ten kids sitting there waiting and they won't be able to go anywhere. Very sad story. All right, so let's look at fuel expenses and then we'll bring back the Rolling Stones, at least for a brief moment. So suppose I have this study, big study, right? Sample size of 6,841. I wanna find the average monthly fuel expense per household vehicle. So what information do I have? Let's make ourselves a list up here. The sample size is huge, 6,841. The population standard deviation is 20.45. It says the margin of error in estimating the mean at the 95% confidence interval. So it should say at the 95% confidence level, not interval. Who types these things up? All right, so if it's 95%, then my alpha is 0.05. So the first thing I want to do is I want to find Z alpha over 2. So Z alpha over 2 is going to be z of 0.025. You're going to start realizing these numbers show up the same over and over. So z of 0.025, oh, look at that, 1.96. All right, so what do I have to do? My error is going to be that z alpha over 2, so the 1.96, times the population standard deviation divided by the square root of 6,841. Okay, let's divide. 20.45 divided by the square root of 6841. All right, to two decimal places, that gives me 0.25. So 1.96 times, and actually I can just import the number from before. And that gives me four, 0 0.48. Now these are dollars and cents, right? So it's 48 cent margin of error. So whatever the mean is, and the mean wasn't given in the problem, there's a 48 cent difference then between the low end and the high end. All right, one more problem and we'll wrap this video up. Let's go back to the Rolling Stones problem. Okay, we found a 99% confidence interval that is between 2.03 and 2.51. First question said, determine the margin of error. I already did that for you, 0.24, right? Because between those two, there's 0.24 difference between the mean and the high end, between the mean and the low end. And so in terms of accuracy of the estimation, it's 0.24 of a million dollars difference between the mean and the two extremes. So now the third part wants us to find the sample size required to have a margin of error of 0.1 million, 95% confidence level, okay? And it reminds me that our population standard deviation was 0 0.5. All right, so what formula do we need? This time we don't need the E formula, we need the N. So when you solve the formula for N, you actually end up with something square. Let's bring this up here because the error formula had a square root of n on the bottom. So if you want just n, you're going to have to square the whole thing. All right, so it's z alpha over 2 times sigma over e. z alpha over 2 times sigma over e. That whole thing squared and rounded up to the next whole number. Now, the z alpha over 2 comes from our confidence level. So this wanted a 95% confidence level. So that must mean that alpha is 0.05. So we're looking for half of that. So Z 0.025. So let's come over to our table, right? Go way down the bottom. Z of 0.025 is right in here at 1.96. And the rest of the things we have the numbers for. So Z alpha over two is 1.96. I was given the standard deviation for the population as a half, and the error that I'm willing to accept is 0 0.1. Right, so when I do that, I take my 
and I multiply it by a half and then divide it by 0.1, that gives me 9.8 and then square it. Okay, 96.04 is what I get. So that means that I really need to round that up, even though it's really, really close to 96. I want a sample size of 97. So I've got to take 97 concerts in order for that to work. And then the last question just said, now go back and basically check to see if your problem works. So if you have a mean of 2.35, give me the confidence interval for those earnings. Well, it's going to be between 2.25 and 2.45. So you notice that when we did it before, I think we did it with a 99% confidence level. Yeah, it says right up at the top of the problem, 99% confidence interval. So that 99% confidence interval was wider. The 95% confidence interval is narrower. So if you want to be less confident, you can have a narrower interval. You want to be more confident, you're going to need a wider interval because, well, bottom line is it gives you more room for making mistakes. All right, that's it for this one. We'll pick up with A3 in the next one.